Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 4. 149 Teens in Competition. I'm your host, Madison Whalen, and my co host, Joseph Whalen. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? I am doing fan flippantastic. That's good. <laughs> um, so it's been a while. It has. We took a couple of weeks off. Uh, you had a lot of stuff going on at school there at the tail end of the school year with band and everything. Yeah. So we took a few weeks off, we're back in, and hopefully we should be on a fairly regular schedule for most of the summer now. Yeah. So, we'll see. We'll we'll see how how motivated we are this summer. But that's not what we're talking about today. No, it is not. Today we're talking about teens and competition. So competition is a part of human nature. There's competition in getting jobs, sports, video games, politics, and in pretty much every activity in, in between. Sometimes it can seem like this much competition is bad, but there are also good benefits of competition as long as it's done in the right way. Today on Insights in the Teens, we'll take a look at the pros and cons of competition and how to make the most from competitive activities. Okay. But before we do, I'd like to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions listed under Insights into Things. You can also find video and audio versions listed under Insights into Things. We can be found on most podcast providers, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast nowadays. Um, I'd also like to invite you to give us your feedback on what we're talking about or give us your suggestions on so topics. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights in the things podcast. We're also on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights in the things. Or you can get links to all of these and more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. Okay. Are we ready? We are ready. All right. So what is teen competition? And this comes to us from ballerstatus.com. So competition is a consistent factor throughout our entire lives. During adolescence, teens can use competition to prepare themselves to hand to prepare themselves to handle it in the real world, but with few significant consequences. It can help teens learn to work hard and how to lose with maturity and grace. Teens who compete are also likely to develop empathy and other skills relating to teamwork. This is crucial for life as well because most of us have to get along with coworkers, neighbors, and other people. You know, all those random other people you have to interact with. I have to get along with them? That's not fair. I know, right? I knew I was doing something wrong. <laughs> Learning how to work with other people to achieve a goal during the teenage years can make it easier to adapt to certain situations in the future. Pres- Preservation? Perseverance. Thank you. Perseverance is another important skill that competition can encourage and foster. Improved perseverance makes for better self-esteem and goal achievement. A child who is competitive will likely be more inclined to work hard to be better at a particular activity. This is the type of trade that continues to serve you into your adult years. Winning is always nice and may demonstrate and may and may help demonstrate to teens how their work can pay off. But losing can be good to teach teens how to manage their frustrations and negative emotions. It can help them learn that life is not always fair and that they will not always get their way. 
Of course, with just about anything in life, there are some downsides to competition. Some of the downsides include the pressure and stress to do well. This can become excessive and toxic if left unchecked. There are also the negative emotions caused by losing, which can lead to depression, a loss of self-worth, and an overall sense of failure. While there are many proponents of competition for teenagers, there are, are others who believe that competition can have a negative impact on development. Some think competition is bad for self-esteem because if someone puts in a lot of effort and then they lose, they may feel like they are not recognized for recognized or that their efforts were useless because they are not as good as their competition. There's also the more recent and sometimes controversial idea of participation trophies. Some people some no. Some believe that competitions do not offer motivation and boost perseverance. Instead, it could divide teens and make them look at everyone as a po- as a potential competitor. So whether it's a presidential race or a cross-country race, or the race to be the school valedictorian, competition is everywhere. But is it really a good thing? Is it something we should be instilling in our children? There are mixed reviews when it comes to teaching kids about competitiveness. Some people feel exposing kids to competition teaches them real-life lessons without winning and losing. Uh, I'm sorry, about winning and losing. Others feel competition does more harm than good. Either way, there are pros and cons to both sides. So some of the benefits, when you touched on them already, is it prepares kids for the future, for real-life situations where they're going to have to compete in the real world. It develops important life skills like empathy. You know, if you can't empathize as a kid growing up, it's going to be very difficult to learn that skill later on when the competition is very hard. It expands your comfort zone. So when you're competing, you oftentimes have to step outside that comfort zone in order to be competitive. And it help kid, helps kids to learn from failure. One of the philosophies that we have on this show here is that we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. And competitions really help to push you in that direction. There are drawbacks, though. Too much unnecessary pressure, for instance. Kids and teens are under a lot of pressure to begin with already. When you throw competitions in there, whether it's competing for the highest grades or competing for team sports or competing for band competitions, that can add a lot of stress and can cause anxiety issues. Sometimes it leads to negative feelings. You know, my I joke around saying it's not a competition unless I'm winning. It's because nobody likes to lose, right? You know, somebody... If there's a competition, a real competition, there's a winner and there's a loser. And nobody ever wants to come out on the losing side, especially if you're doing it consistently. Yeah. It can be destructive to your self-esteem. You know, when you're constantly competing, you may be competing in an area that you don't have the skills to compete in. And in doing that, it could highlight the fact that, you know you lack the same skills as the peers that you want to be measured against and that can be destructive to your self-esteem. Have you had any situations where you've had stiff competitions at school or you know with your friends or anything like that where it's caused any kind of issues? Well I definitely can say there's at least two examples. One that I definitely know affected me and one that I feel affected one of my friends. So the first example I have to give is obviously marching band. In marching band, it's kind of expected that you compete. And while it is a very accepting environment, um, you technically are still competing against various bands. And like, we're kind of told to kind of despise certain bands because they're better than us. And it's like, while we don't despise them, it's just like when we hear them, it's like, eh, I don't like that. And, you know, it's stuff like that. But like, When it comes to having to perform in competitions, knowing that you're being judged on it, as well as having to also go through just all the adjustments you have to do in marching band, it gets stressful. I was certainly very stressed at the competitions when I knew I had to do well, and like I wanted us to get a larger score, and when we didn't get a larger score that I had hoped for, I feel kind of beaten down by it. 
Yeah, and and that's that's an interesting type of competition because that's that's really a subjective competition where <clears throat> your performance is not you're not performing against a clock or you're not trying to score the most home runs or or goals in a in a uh, hockey game or something that it's not measurable it's not subjectively measurable i'm sorry it's not objectively measurable it's subjectively measurable where your performance you could do exactly the same thing as the team before you but you could be judged differently depending on the person who's doing the judging depending on the school that you're at depending on a number of circumstances you could do the same exact routine as another school but maybe you did it later in the day and the judges have warmed up now and they're more harsh in how they're judging so it's one of those things where it's not cut and dry like if you were racing somebody and it's two people on the track racing against the clock whoever gets from point a to point b fastest wins that's objective you're not going to debate that it's not going to no matter what time of day it is no matter what kind of shoes you wear it doesn't matter you have a clock that you're running against but with marching band and and this is kind of the the tact the tact that i have with olympic sports that are judged like figure skating or gymnastics i don't like those things being in the olympics because you can easily have tainted judges in there that are making bad decisions yeah. and it's, and it happens all the time and the russian judges are always called into question for how they're judging competitions and whether you win or lose at a competition should not come down to the judge it should come down to your individual achievement so when it comes to marching band that's sort of what you're running into is you're you're running into how you appear to someone else and even though you may do exactly the same thing as another team you may be judged differently and and that makes the competitions more I don't want to say cutthroat, but it's almost like, okay, so we don't like this team because they always score higher. Well, maybe the judges are from that town, or maybe the judge has kids there, or his grandkids. Or, you know, there's always that, that something in the back of your mind that says, okay, well, I did as good as they did. How come I didn't get higher points? And it makes you question that, that scoring system, too. What was your other... Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. My other example is something that is kind of measurable, but hasn't affected me as much as I feel it's affected my friend. So I've talked to you a decent am amount about this, but for the context of the viewers, um, me and my one friend, Kenny, um, are technically the two smartest kids. Um, the in highest grade point highest averages, grade point we'll average. say. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> highest grade point averages in um, our freshman class. And Occasionally, when after Kenny had realized that I was second, he's he was slightly higher than me in the first two marking periods. Slightly, slightly higher. For the record. Yeah, I got that. So, because when he learned that, um, he started asking me constantly, like, "Hey, what are your grades? What do your grades look like? I want to compare them." And it's like it was kind of a competition in a way on like who would end up getting. The highest grade point average at the end of the year although the school technically doesn't count it it only counts it for half the year um but he was still you know curious and wanted to like you know see and like he kept getting worried that like oh you're gonna beat me this time or, like because he would get like a bad grade in our eyes aka like a 90 or something so it, that one's interesting because that can have a both a positive and a negative effect as a positive, it's driving him to do better in school because he wants to win the competition. From a negative standpoint, if he doesn't win the competition, how do you think that's going to make him feel at the end of the year? Yeah, like, the thing that I definitely started noticing, like, the thing is, I don't really care. As long as I just get A's in my classes, I don't really care all that much about being, you know the highest grade point average in the freshman class. I just really care, you know, I just get A's and such. But, um, but Kenny, like, he would, he was the one always asking me, what do your grades look like? I need to compare your grades. And he always would say, like, oh, you're probably going to beat me now. Oh, I have, 
my grades are not looking all that good. And, like, we would basically have to go through the, the statistics of, like, oh, well, I have advanced history, you don't. I have accelerated ELA, you have advanced. And, like, we had to, like, he wanted us to, like, calculate it objectively and, like, see which of us would have gotten the highest grade in the end. And right, so you're not in the same classes at the same level on everything, so it's not really a one-to-one -one -one apples to apples comparison some grades are weighted higher than others and that affects what your event your uh, ultimate grade point average is so so it's kind of hard but but that's where that negative comes in where he starts to obsess about that sort of thing and it becomes important to him and it's okay as long as he uses that as a motivating factor if he starts to obsess about that and he, he starts to you know, put pressure on himself or stress on himself. If he's not the top, then then that starts to get unhealthy. You know. Yeah, and like I definitely started seeing part of me in him at that point about how I can tend to obsess over my own grades. And while again, I didn't really care all that much about high grade point average. I was the one that like didn't really care all that much as long as I was getting A's. Mm -hmm. Um but like I saw how much he was obsessing over it and made me re and it made me realize you know I kind of do that. Not with this, but like just to get A's. And Yes, you do. Yeah, that's part of that perfectionist thing that we talked about previously. Yeah. So uh, I think we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the benefits and the drawbacks of competition in teams. We'll be right back. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic, with hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Starforge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars Trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about teens and competition. And now we're going to talk a bit more about the drawbacks of competition. And this comes to us from VeryWellFamily.com. So those who are against instilling competitiveness in kids, or even imposing them to com competitions in general, believe that competition is destructive and toxic. Their fear is that it places too much pressure on kids to be the best, whether it is in a spelling bee or a soccer match. They also argue that it can cause unnecessary stress and anxiety. Those opposed to competition believe that when children are placed in competitive settings, they are often left feeling disappointed, defeated, and bad about themselves. Worse yet, competition can be destructive to self-esteem, especially if kids feel like they do not measure up or that they are not being recognized for their efforts. To ward off these negative experiences, many parents remove the competitive aspect of every activity and declare everyone a winner. In other words, it's the everyone gets a trophy mentality. Research does indicate that turning low stakes activities into competitions is bad for kids. Research has found that competitions do little to motivate kids. One study team observed two California high schools that gave out gold or platinum ID cards to kids who scored well on standardized tests. What they found was that the program not only had little motivation for lower achieving students, it also increased inequality and division among students. And I think I see similar types of results in work environments where when you try to motivate your employees by incentivizing them to work harder or, you know, 
put in extra effort or work extra time or be extra vigilant. And, and what happens is the people that naturally do that get rewarded for it, and they usually pretty much appreciate the rewards. The people that don't do those things generally aren't going to do those things no matter what. Mm-hmm. And eventually what it does is it builds a sort of resentment and, it, and kind of a, a division in classes where you have the overachievers, you have the average people, and then you have the underachievers. Some of the average people, you can kind of motivate them into being overachievers. The underachievers are content being underachievers as long as they don't get fired from their jobs or you know miss out entirely on what's going on at school. So you're probably not going to motivate them. Yeah. But what happens is the underachievers now really resent the overachievers. Before it was just, okay, they're making, they're putting in the extra effort and and all that stuff. Well, now they're getting rewards for it. Well, I'm doing my job. I'm doing the bare minimum. Why am I not getting a reward? And it starts to build some resentment there. Yeah. When it comes to kids, though, if there's no benefit to it, there's no point in having a competition at all. Yeah, that's definitely something I... I can kind of attest to, because it's like, when you look at the aspect of what kids will actually do, like, thing is, I feel that kids, eat, like, want some form of a reaction, which is why I kind of feel, it's one of the main reasons why I feel like, if you tell a kid that they, they can't do something, they're gonna do it, because they want to get a reaction, or they have gonna want to see what happens. Um, and, like, in a way, it's a motivating factor, and, like... You've done it with me, like, getting good grades. I get, like, you know, a treat or something. Right. It's like... That well, I, you get a reward. You don't get a treat. Treats we give to the fine, cats. Fine, <laughs> fine. I get a reward for it. Like, when I get good grades, I get a reward. So it's like, that's a good motivating factor. And you've done it with other things. Um, so, like, basically in order to help motivate me, you give me, like, small, small rewards. Right, and and I think that works. I think in a society where everyone gets a trophy in a competition, it's not a competition. Yeah. So you're portraying it. There there are life lessons to come out of competitions because kids are going to run into competitions constantly in their lives. And when you degrade the effect of a competition by giving everyone an award then you set an expectation in these kids that everybody gets a reward in a competition. No matter what they do. No matter what. So they don't have to perform well. And what's going to happen is you're going to set that expectation and reinforce it over multiple, quote, competitions. And eventually the kids are going to get to a point where they have a real competition and they're going to not be bothered to put the effort in because they always get a reward anyway. And then they're going to have a rude awakening and they're not going to benefit from any of the good things that can come from a competition. Yeah. So if competition is not going to have any positive outcome, then don't have a competition. Certainly don't have a competition if you're going to reward everyone for the competition because then it's not a competition. Yeah. Then it's just a group event at that point. Mm -hmm. So there are positives of competition. Those who embrace competition as a fact of life believe that a little healthy competition might actually be good for kids. Aside from preparing them for wins and losses later in their adult life, competitive activities help kids develop important skills like resilience, perseverance, and tenacity. They also learn how to take turns, encourage others, and develop empathy like we've mentioned. Many coaches feel that parenting is not just about safety and security, but also about expanding a child's comfort zone. In other words, it's important for kids to get used to the frustration that comes from competition. More importantly, it helps to have them it helps them circumvent the desire to quit or give up when things get tough. Although it's important for a child to know they are safe, it's also important to allow a child to experience the instability and uncertainty that comes from competitive situations. 
One of the biggest mistakes some parents make is protecting their kids from failure. Failure is not a bad thing. We've talked about this many times. And we even have an entire podcast on it. Yes, we do. It might feel uncomfortable, but it's a wonderful opportunity to learn. And failure is okay if you learn from it. Learning from failure not only motivates kids to work harder and improve a skill, but it also can help them become more capable adults that do not crumble the first time things get tough. Kids can learn how to lose and still feel good about their efforts. All in all, healthy competition can teach kids that it's not always the best that are successful, but rather those who work hard and stick it out that are real winners in the end. The key is to find healthy ways for your kids to compete. Now, one of the things I think that's important to take away from this is, you know, coaches don't want you to quit. They want you to stick it out. Well, if you're talking about getting people out of their comfort zone and getting people to have experiences that they can learn from, quitting is one of those experiences. Now, I don't encourage everybody to just quit what they're doing if it gets hard. But there's consequences to quitting. So anytime you participate, for instance, in an extra extracurricular activity, there's a cost associated with it. There's a cost in dollars, in time, in effort. And you're going to invest a certain amount in that before you, you reach that difficult point where you don't want to do it anymore, where it gets too hard or you know it gets too inconvenient or it's taking up too much time or it's too hot in the summer to do whatever it is everyone's going to have a different reason for wanting to quit and i think kids need to have that option to quit if they feel forced into it they're just going to do it because they have to do it and they're not going to learn much from that other than if i don't have a choice i can be forced into it if kids have the option to quit and they're allowed to quit then let them deal with the consequences to it you quit your job Okay? When you're an adult, you might not like your boss. You might get angry because you're passed over for a promotion. You might think you're qualified for that position that they, they you know, gave to somebody else. You may not think you make enough money. You always have the option to quit. But if you quit when you don't have something else lined up, there are consequences to it. How are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to put food on the table? How are you going to keep a roof over your head? So allowing kids to, to quit at that early age and see that there are consequences makes them stop to evaluate the benefits of quitting versus sticking it out. And then if they stick it out, then they really appreciate the benefits that they get from it if they chose to stick it out rather than having been forced to stick it out. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I definitely agree with that because, like, the kids aren't really going to like it anymore if they are forced into it rather than having the opportunity and the chance to quit. Now obviously if they're given that opportunity it gives them the experience um, of the consequences that come with quitting and then they might have a whole new appreciation for it and it's like thing is I don't like it when kids are told they're forced to do something, especially when it comes to quitting an extracurricular activity. I feel that if they are told to stick it out, even it, like, it's kind of the exact opposite of when they're told to not do something. If, they to if they're told to not do something, they want to do it, but if they're forced into doing something, they more than likely don't want to do it. And I think the largest part, like you said, is giving them a choice. Like, like, basically, it can work in both examples. Like, if you want them to continue on and not quit at something, you can say, okay, well, you can quit if you want to, but be aware of the consequences. And it's kind of the same thing when you tell them to not do something. Instead of saying, oh, you're not allowed to do this, just say, okay, you probably shouldn't do this, but if you are going to do it, you be prepared to face the consequences. And I agree. And I think as parents, our responsibility parents and guardians and teachers and mentors and all those people that help kids make these these decisions our job is not to make the decisions for you at a certain age yes but once you reach a certain age and, and that's sort of the audience that we're talking to here when you get to 12 13 years old you need to start making decisions for yourself 
and the older you get the more decisions you should be making when you reach that point us as your guides through life should be helping you to identify those choices and the consequences and as long as you understand what the consequences are of your choices then you're free to make those choices as long as you accept those consequences yeah like that's the thing that like is definitely like the main what i feel is really what being a parent is about it's not just like keeping your kids in line it's just having them understand and helping them cope at with the consequences that can come with their actions. Absolutely. So what does healthy competition look like? So competitiveness by itself is genuinely not a bad thing. It's how people approach competitions that can make them unhealthy. In other words, if the only goal is to win and not learn anything in the process, kids are going to feel discouraged when they lose. But if parents, coaches, and fans learn how to look at losing constructively, then kids will learn a lot more from the competitions they participate in. It's important, it's important the competition fosters a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset. For instance, when kids believe that the qualities they have cannot be changed, such as being bad at math, then they have a fixed mindset. Consequently, when kids have this mindset, they believe that change is not possible and they are stuck with, that, with what they are given. Such as a basketball active, a bi such as a basketball ability, intelligence, artistic talent, and so on, and they cannot, and that they cannot change or suddenly develop soccer skills, music talent, or a propensity propensity for math. Additionally, kids with a fixed mindset often feel the need to prove themselves over and over again, and often evaluate themselves in an all-or-nothing kind of way. The opposite of a fixed mindset is the growth mindset. Kids who have a growth mindset recognize their current skills and abilities, but believe that they can change, improve, or add new skills with time and effort. As a result, when kids have a growth mindset, they are more likely to approach competition understanding that if they do not do well, it is not the end of the world. They know that they can learn and improve, and more importantly, they are willing to try. And a great example of that would be your, your marching band competition example. So early in the season, you guys have a rudimentary program, let's say. Your first one or two competitions. And having gone to all of them last year, you can, I can really see how the performance evolves. And it's not just because you're performing more and getting better. It's because you guys add more things to the routine. You know... You do that by getting feedback from the judges, by seeing what other people are doing in different bands and getting new fresh ideas, and you learn what you have to do to get better and get higher scores. So that's definitely a growth mentality there where it's like, well, I just can't play this trumpet any better than I'm playing it right now, and this is just as good as we're going to get. Nobody's like that in band. Everybody shows up for practice, you learn the new routines, you do it over and over again, you get really good at what you do, and then you add more stuff onto it to get better. And that's really what they're talking about here is recognizing where in a competition or why in a competition you failed and address those failures. Mm -hmm. And that's how we learn from failure. You know, if I can't get that high a on a math test that I want let me go back and see what questions I got wrong maybe there's a pattern maybe there's a certain concept in math that I didn't really grasp at the time and I thought that I did maybe I didn't read that book all the way through as thoroughly as I did or maybe I read it late at night and I just sort of you know cruise through the last chapter there and I didn't really get what I wanted let me go back and reinforce that there's always that chance to improve do you find that when you're in a situation like that, that you actually take the time to go back and improve yourself if you, if you see a failure? Yeah, especially in the test examples. Whenever I see that I've got a question wrong, I, like, I can definitely attest that example to math, especially when it comes to us checking our homework. Like, when I see that I get 
us some questions wrong on the homework, I'm like, okay, where did I get that wrong? Why did I get that wrong? And eventually I learn from it and then it's like, okay, I'll just know that for a similar problem to this, in the future, I just need to grasp the idea that I needed to fix this problem. And I do the same thing at work. When we have a failure at work, whether it's a, a hardware failure or a process failure or whatever it is, once we solve the problem, we go back and we do an after-action analysis. We determine what the cause of failure was, what could have been done to prevent it, and we either add redundancy into that area if it's a hardware issue, or we look at changing the policies we have so that maybe we improve our maintenance routines. Maybe we have better on-call staff to deal with that when it happens. Maybe we improve our communications ability so that if it happens, we can respond faster. You can't prevent everything from happening. You can't pass every test. You can't win every competition. But any time that you don't come out on top, there's an opportunity to learn and improve and get better and move on. And it translates, that habit of improvement translates directly into the real world when you get out of school. And that's really the important thing to keep in mind. We're going to take our next break. And when we come back, we will talk about how to talk to your child about competition. Very much like we're doing here. I know, right? <laughs> we'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking about... Insights into something. <laughs> Sorry, I went blank for a second. Uh, not good when, you know, the title of your podcast is also the title. <laughs> well, and we've got on a big screen TV right next to us, too. I try to look at the camera when I do that. Anyway, we're talking about teens and competition today. And now we're going to talk about how to talk to your child about competition. Much like we're doing now. There you go. So, as a parent, you have the power to help your kids think positively about competition. For starters, healthy competition helps kids see that competition isn't just about winning and losing. Make sure your kids know that competition is really about setting a goal and then accomplishing that goal. In other words, instead of focusing on winning, focus on what your child has control over, such as the number of shots they take in a basketball game, or the amount of time they invest in practicing for a solo and ensemble competition. At the end of the competition, the overall outcome matters less than whether or not they accomplish what they set out to do. It's important for parents to be there to support their kids through the challenges. You also need to regularly enforce the message that it is okay to lose as long as they are working hard, putting in their effort, and learning from the experience. In fact, some coaches will indicate that the biggest lesson kids will learn from competition is that the biggest competitor is themselves. In other words, kids not only need to learn to believe in themselves and their abilities, but also, but also discover that their identity is not tied to winning or losing, but to their character in either scenario. They also need to recognize different types of goals. Clearly there are some competitive situations that our primary goal is to win. While this is fine in some situations, there's also a loser. If winning is the only goal that a child is focused on, it's bound to create an unhealthy environment. Remember, no one has control over the outcome of the game. At least, we hope they don't. Yeah. 
As a result, it's better for kids to have other goals besides winning, such as a goal based on personal performance. Maybe they'll lose the game, but they'll see their skill level improve in some way. Um, they should also promote personal traits rather than outcome. Whether they are playing a sport, entering a dance competition, or participating in the Science Olympics, Olympiad? Ol Olympiad. Olympiad, okay. Um, there will be times in a child's life where they must compete with others. In these situations, take the focus off of winning and instead focus on the things they can control, like their effort. Then, regardless of the outcome, help your kids see what they did well. For instance, were they extremely focused? Did they show a lot of greedy behavior? Did they manage their time well? It's important for kids to see that success is not about winning. Then, in the future, when they do not get into the college of their choice or they do not land the job they wanted, they will be able to step back and reflect on what they did as well as where they might try to improve. Remember that failure is part of success. As odd as it might sound at first, allowing a child to fail is one of the most important aspects of competition. When a child is allowed to fail, they discover that they can recover from it, learn from it, and move on from it. Failing or losing a competition does not have to define them. Unfortunately, though, many children today are afraid of failure. Maybe they're afraid others will bully them or make fun of them or perhaps they're afraid of disappointing their parents. Whatever the reason, fear can prevent kids from trying things that are hard. When this happens, this can reduce their opportunities to grow as well as their opportunities for success. One thing parents can do is share their experiences with failure and what they learn from it. The goal is to allow kids a chance to experience failure before they get to college. This way, when they experience challenges or failure, they'll simply see it as a way of life and be able to move on in a healthy way. You should also give your approval freely. Some parents will withhold love and approval when their child does not perform up to their standards or win a competition. When this happens, the child can become panicked inside because they do not feel loved or secure. What's more, they start to believe that they are not enough or that they are lacking in some way and that they're the parent will never value them if they do not win. More often than not, when this happens, kids start working their tail off trying to make their parents happy. But trying to impress their parents is a dangerous course that can be determinable detrimental. Thank you. Detrimental to their mental well being. Instead, children benefit when their parents give them love and approval freely without and without condition. Children should always feel like they are loved unconditionally, even when they lose. You know, if your kids have tails that they can work off, they got different problems to worry about to begin with. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, so what do you do if competition stresses your kid out? Because it's going to happen. It, you know, there's enough stress already. Yeah. Sometimes kids are so resistant to competition that they may refuse to participate in any competitive activity. They also might fake an illness or show signs of anxiety. While it's normal for kids to feel a little anxious before a big competition, they should not be so worried that it's impacting other areas of their life. Whether it's a big game, a standardized test, a band competition, or the state spelling bee, if the fear of competition is impacting your child, you may want to dig deeper to see what's under the surface. There could be anxiety or depression at play, or it could just be an unhealthy view of competition. Many people will often advise against allowing an anxious child to quit an activity. Before long, quitting could become a way of life for the child if they never learn how to manage their distress. However, there are some instances when it's okay to quit, such as being bored with a sport. Parents can always talk with their child about whether their skills could be better utilized elsewhere and encourage them to try a new activity they might be more engaged with. The next time performance anxiety rears its ugly head, try teaching your child some calming techniques to help them keep the butterflies at bay. It's also important to provide support and reassurance as much as possible. With each stressful competition activity, the competitive activity the child 
conquers, the more mental strength and stamina they will have for competitive situations in the future. Preserving... Persevering. Preser thank you. Persevering through the anxiety and the challenges that co competition provides is where the real growth happens. And it's like muscles, you know? Muscles atrophy. They get soft and they get less powerful if you don't use them. Facing competition is the same way. The more competition you face, the more confidence you have, win or lose. You know, it helps to build the, comp the, the confidence that you need to be successful moving forward. If you lose, figure out why you lost, work to improve that area, and the next time you go into that competition, you're going to have more confidence, you're going to have more capability of dealing with it. So that's all we had for today. We're going to take another quick break and come back. We'll get your closing thoughts, finish up the podcast business, and that'll be it. All right. We'll be right back. All right. So I just wanted to tell everyone that competition um, uh, overall is definitely something that pretty much every child should experience. While I used to have you... Um, some more negative views on competition and how it affects mental health and such. Looking at it from a different perspective, it really does help kids. It will help them for the future. It can build their resistance as long it, as it is healthy. If there's a healthy dose of competition and it's handled in a decent manner, competition can really be beneficial for children as they move on into adulthood but when the competition starts to become a bit more stressful that's kind of when you kind of need to look back and realize that it's unhealthy so really just keep a healthy balance of it sage advice as always thank you that is all we had today i want to invite you all to subscribe to the podcast you can find audio versions of this podcast listed as insights into teens you can find video versions and audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Things. We're listed on TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google, Spotify, anywhere you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite you to reach out to us, give us your feedback, tell us how we're doing, uh, tell us uh, show topics. We're always interested in getting new topics that we can uh, address for folks. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can find high-res versions of all of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insightsintothings. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insightsintothings. And you can get all this and much more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother Sam. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.